it takes all of us pitching in to make this work. I especially want to thank um, all of the families, kif1a.org and Ovid Therapeutics and some of the family um, and some of my team members who are here and online today. Okay, so let me stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Chung. I just wanted to say also that any questions that are answered um, at the end of this session, we will address and publish in a blog post um, on the website when we're all done. But um, it sounds like you just addressed uh, the leading question. That was how long will it take until we hear back regarding the Koala study? It sounds like they're answering emails today, correct? Yes, they're answering today and then also first part of the week. Okay, and then we had another question about the heterozygous mutations for KIF1A. Um, specifically, does it mean that you make one healthy protein for every broken protein, and do the broken ones cause a traffic jam for the healthy ones? Great question, and the short answer is yes. Um, you've got half and half, 50-50, but it feels like the 50 that's not working quite right is um, is sort of toxic, if you will, to the part that's good. And so we need to we need to get rid of that is the current thinking. Okay. And then this one about, um, are you aware of any studies that correlate seizure activity or cerebral atrophy with cortical vision impairment? And then is there a reason to expect that cortical vision impairment is under, under identified and they reference CDKL5 and Rett syndrome? So I'm sure it's under identified in part for our young people who are either nonverbal or minimally verbal. It's oftentimes hard to see what they're seeing or know what they're seeing until they literally, um, you know, or anyway, we see evidence from from things that are safety issues or other issues. But I'm sure it's underdiagnosed. Um, it's difficult for the neurologist or ophthalmologist sometimes to even see it themselves as well. And so uh, I don't know the percentage it's undiagnosed, but I'm sure it is. I, I do think in general there are correlations of severity overall so that as we're seeing some of the brain atrophy, some of the particular variants, some of the seizures, these all tend to go together in terms of severity and rapidity of progression. Okay, and then we have another question. Will you be able to test treatments on genetic material sampled from CAN patients like cell lines? Of yep. the 300 diagnosed, my niece was number 67. Yep, great, great point. Um, so we do have several cell lines from people uh, already in the community that we use on a daily basis in the laboratory. And these are not just us, but we've distributed these to researchers around the world who are using these. So incredibly important. Uh, as you, If you do end up coming to Columbia, one other thing we'll be using with your blood samples is to make more of those cell lines to make your, sure you're represented. Uh, as we're doing those, we're making those into brain cells in a dish and testing those treatments. So we can do it in a way that's safe to you. We don't have to expose you if there's something toxic or problematic. We can simply see your cells in addition, do the trial and error there before we get to people. And then somebody asked, when in their medical diagnosis journey would you like them to contact the natural history study? Um, they said they're a 43-year-old adult, um, and depending on what registry they look at, one says likely pathogenic and one says variant of unknown significance. Yep, great question. So um, just in terms of the language, a variant of uncertain significance means that the laboratory is not sure that your diagnosis is KIF-1A. Um, in some cases, we can look at parents to see if parents have that same genetic variant and whether or not they have symptoms. And in general, if we see that the genetic variant is new or that it's seen in a parent with the same symptoms, then we can reclassify it to being likely pathogenic. And so the question in terms of when on that diagnostic journey we want to see people who have likely pathogenic or pathogenic variants or where we can help you gather the evidence to reinterpret a variant of uncertain significance to be likely pathogenic. But we are uh, trying to limit it in terms of studying individuals where we're certain of the diagnosis. Okay. And this question is, have you seen any effects with diet and seizure activity? I did reference in your presentation that a couple of people had tried a ketogenic diet uh, what I would say is there, I'm not seeing anything that's completely transformational. So in terms of a ketogenic diet for some conditions will really, really reduce seizure frequency. I haven't heard any reports of anything like that. If someone has, certainly let me know. Um, but in terms of the mechanism, I'm not surprised by that, that not being, you know, completely curative. Um, within this, I, I'm guessing it's going to be more medications than it is diet. Um, lots of questions also regarding life expectancy. 
Yeah. So I know this is the scary part, especially after uh, knowing so many people in the community where um, life has been cut short. So number one, and I think our goal is even without a cure, how do we be able to increase both life expectancy as well as quality life with currently available medications and treatments? And I fully believe that we can do better just with what we have right now. It's simply a matter of aggregating sort of best practices and watching out for the things we need to watch for. Um, in terms of life expectancy, um, it's very, very, very variable. And I know that was a lot of varies. Um, but the point is, is that even the, those, these are all tied together by being related to KIF-1A. There's certain genetic variants that are very, very severe and the life expectancy might be measured in a few years to some where the genetic variant is much milder and might be measured in decades. And I know that's really hard to wrap your head around. And if you're a parent or a grandparent out there, you're saying, but what about me? Where do I fall within that spectrum? Um, and so if there are people that want to offline talk to us, we're glad to go into it. It's, it's hard to cover all sort of, um, you know, dozens of genetic variants in one session with the group, but we'll be glad to talk with you online. And if you come for Koala, we'll certainly be glad to talk with you then. Thank you. Um, another question about, have we seen diagnoses of auditory processing disorder or sensory processing disorder with kif patients? Great point. So uh, the answer is yes. Um, and individuals oftentimes who carry an autism diagnosis will have many of those same issues as well. Um, not to say that everyone with autism does, but those are some of the things. And as you think about what treatments or supports might help, some of those same traditional things in terms of um, sensory integration therapy, some of the same ABA therapy, some of the same things that we do from an educational therapy point of view can be helpful. I'll also say, and you saw it in the photos, aqua therapy, I find extremely helpful um, because people are just free to move without having to worry about stumbling or coordinating and falling. And so for those of you who do have access to that, especially in the summertime, I find that very helpful. Would you say the same for like dysautonomia? Have you seen that diagnosis reported as well? So dysautonomia and autonomic dysfunction, extremely common. Uh, people may oftentimes have symptoms and not have it diagnosed as that, but I do believe that, um, and I was showing you, I didn't show you pictures, but just the descriptions, temperature regulation issues, heart, heart rate, blood pressure, um, blotching of the skin, all of those are reflection of autonomic dysfunction. And then um, a question about how far off are dumb viruses, which can replace defective DNA in each and every cell? Oh, good question. So um, without getting too much into the details, I don't know that we'll be able to use a virus to just put back in the right KIF-1A. I think it's going to be more complicated than that. I think we're going to have to take out the bad KIF-1A and maybe we're going to have to put in the good KIF-1A both. That may get us exactly at 100% of the protein, but that may be really hard. So there are other strategies we're trying, thinking about just taking out the bad KIF-1A, maybe the first best thing to do um, that we can achieve. And then there are also people trying strategies of what we call gene editing or being able to literally like surgical scissors, cut out the genetic variant, the problematic uh, genetic variant and sew in the right one, uh, being able to do kind of little mini gene surgery. That's a ways off. It's not, that's certainly not going to be our first treatment, but in the next, I don't know if it'll be five or 10 years, uh, but in longer term, uh, I hope something like that will be possible. And I hope someday it'll be possible for brain conditions. For persons that have not had a seizure in many years, would you recommend annual EEGs still be completed? Um, for that, number one is always talk to your neurologist. Uh, depending on how long it's been and what those seizures were like, it may or may not be that you need to do it every single year. Um, but if it's been several years, it wouldn't be bad to check in with your neurologist um, because things are changing, information's changing, and there may be something um, that can be done if there is a seizure that's undiagnosed, especially in sleep. I'll just point out that I think sometimes we under-recognize seizures in sleep. Absolutely. So that's nice to have those 24-hour EEGs or longer to capture those. Um, we have a question about what does the switch one and two mean from the variant table that was... Uh -huh. 
Okay, very good. So that's getting a little down into the weeds, but when we think about the particular domains of the protein for KIF-1A, the, those are the feet region that I was into. It refers to different domains or very, very small portions of those protein that may have to do in terms of some of the movement of the protein, what it has to do with ATP hydrolysis and release, um, but very specific regions. And it looks like we see a concentration of mutations within those regions because they seem to be very sensitive. The protein needs to have those particular regions working just perfectly to make the protein work right. And then when do you think we would see the results of the koala study? Uh, so uh, what I hope is that um, I think we're planning, you guys will correct me if we're wrong, but I think we're planning on a summer meeting in 2023 in person. And assuming that happens, what I am plan on doing is any results we have from koala by then, we will give the group an update at that meeting in, in next summer. Another question is, if there's, if it's as simple as a deficient protein, can we find a way of increasing that protein through IV or injections? Um, I know we're looking at all treatment strategies, but I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, sure. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than just giving back the protein because we need the protein to get into the cells and we need to get it specifically into the brain cells and the nerve cells. And right now we don't have a way of being able to do that. Just giving, uh, even if we could make it in a big vat in my kitchen, we don't have a way of being able to infuse it through the IV or eat it and get it to the right place. So we are working on strategies. As I said, I don't know that just putting back in more of the good is going to do it. I think we may have to actually sort of take out the garbage at the same time. So we're, you're going to hear about it later this afternoon, but strategies to be able to do that, either things that can do it in the short term, or we're also thinking about um, even if we have a short-term solution, how we might have to get to a, or how we can get to a long-term permanent solution. So um, there are several different ways, you know, people are thinking about several different ways to do it, um, ways of manipulating gene expression like you're talking about where we might decrease the amount of the gene that's got the bad uh, problem, sort of making that quiet down or dampen down, but without affecting the amount of the good version of KIF-1A that's out there. So it's a, a difficult balancing act, but that's a strategy that we're trying and others are trying now. There are also folks trying um, what we call small molecules, but things like pills or medicines that you might be able to take by mouth that would do also what you're talking about, increasing the amount of the good KIF-1A or related to keeping cells, brain cells healthy so that even though they might be partially damaged, how can they kind of repair themselves or stay healthy for a longer period of time? So all sorts of different strategies are being tried and, and I want to give KIF-1A.org a lot of credit. They have managed to pull together researchers, the best and the brightest researchers from around the world, all really pulling together and working together in complementary ways to try many different strategies. I think that's the wrap on our session, but I'll take the rest of the questions from the chat and make sure we address them in a blog post. Thank you so much, Dr. Chung. Thanks, Shannon.